Welcome to the latest episode of the podcast, The Way Out is In. I'm Joe Confino, working at the intersection of personal transformation and systems change. And I am Brother Fab Hu, a Zen Buddhist monk in the tradition of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh in the Plum Village community. And today we have a special guest. Sister Zhang Hing Tam. She will be joining us from the New Hamlet. Hello, <laughs> I'm Sister Hing Tam from Korea. The way out is in. So, Brother Fat Poo, do you want to just introduce us? Why do people want to become monks and nuns? What's that like? Ooh, that's a big question. And I think you will hear different answers from everyone, um, every monastic that you encounter when you ask this question. But I like to see it as, um, as a way of following our hearts. So our teacher, Thay, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, he shares that everyone needs a spiritual dimension in their daily life to help us maintain our balance. And within our self, we have this seed, we call it bodhicitta, and everyone has this. It's called the mind of love or the mind of awakening. And when you are in touch with a spiritual practice, and for us, it's in this Buddhist uh, tradition, in this uh, tradition of Plum Village. We get to see the wonders of life in the present moment. That's what, we, that's what we're training every day. And for some, when we, for some of us, when we are encountered on this path, we see that this seed wants to grow even further, wants to go even uh, more in-depth. And therefore, there is this other way of life and we call it the monastic life and we learn to let go of our worldly possession worldly careers worldly desire and learn to live a more simple and happy life and because we see that as a monk or a nun we can also offer something to society and the world and that's what we call aspiration yeah and tell us a little bit about that because one of the things Thich Nhat Hanh is known best for is engaged Buddhism mm. or active Buddhism, which is about saying, actually, we don't, it's not about having monastics living in a monastery high up in the mountains, that actually it's about, you know, the history of Thai is actually that he engaged in society. Yes. So I think this is why I was very attracted to Plum Village because of this aspect of engagement. And when I came from my first retreat in 1996, it was during the summer and there were so many people, so many different children, and it was very international. And that was super cool for someone coming from Canada to be in touch with so many different culture. And what I recognized was the monastics that were guiding us through this retreat, they weren't like statues. They weren't like a Buddha statue that is like smiling and looking down on us, but they were right beside us. They were practicing with us and they were showing us how to practice by their way of living and that for me is engagement that was also a way for some of us who live a norm, quote unquote normal life to see that we can be very close to those who are are also on the spiritual path and there's no um there's this feeling of like no distinction in a way and and that for me was what helped me enter into this um, community. And when I was observing the monks and nuns during the retreat, it was very busy. They had to take care of like hundreds of people. But I recognized that they had so much ease and joy. And that was very alive. And that somehow really impressed me. Even though I was very young, that really impressed me. And I believe that... Uh, they were able to do what they are doing is because they have what we call mindfulness, this awareness, as well as this sense of contribution 
to the joy and the happiness of everyone around them. And, 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 and later on, as I became a monk, I learned that that is a way of engagement that we practice not just to be peaceful for ourselves and to be happy for ourselves, but our practice is a way of contribution to society, to the ones around us. And for me, that, that was very inspiring. That's why I wanted to become a monk. Um, it helped me see that there is a way of life that can offer happiness and it's very cheap to shave your head, <laughs> <laughs> wear a brown robe and learn to be more kind and more slow and more um, present. Right, Sister, it would be lovely to, for our audience to get to know you a bit. So, so tell us a little bit about what your life was like before you decided to become a monastic. Um, so I, I worked for TV. I, I, I work as a TV writer in the broadcasting station and yeah, I, I live very busy life, like, like another normal people. Yeah. And, and I was really a workaholic and I really work like seven days per week. Yeah. I really, I was always in the office and I, I was just ordinary people. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and what was your attraction to Plum Village? For me, I didn't know about the Plum Village not much. And um, I, I, for me, the first time I visit Plum Village was 2017. And at the time was I also uh, joined the retreat by accidentally. Yeah, accidentally. Because... Uh, at the time, I just finished one TV show, and I had a um, like a three months gap between start a new program. So I decided to go to the Philippines for having a nice vacation. But I share my plan to my dad, and my dad say, "Oh, if you have a, such a long time of a uh, break, you should go to Plum Village, and you should meet the Thai." And so I said. Where, where is Plum Village? <laughs> I ask. And, and my father says it's in France. So you should go and the meet Thai and yeah, you should join the retreat and so. But I already like book every airplane ticket and every like resort and everything I already booked, full fully booked. And so I say I need to pay the, what is the cancellation fee? Yeah. Mm. So what should I do? And he said, my father said, no, don't worry. If you go to Plum Village, I will pay everything. Yeah, and my, because my father really wanted me to uh, bring to the Plum Village France. And that's why I came here for the first time in my life. Yeah, for like a representative for my family. Mm. And what was your experience? What, what, what was it from leading this really busy life, yeah, really hectic, yeah. to coming here? What, what was the moment where you suddenly thought, actually, there's something here I want to explore? It was very interesting for me because, I mean, first of all, I didn't know much about what, what things will happen in the Plum Village retreat. And it was spring and it was very quiet in Lower Hamlet. And... Yeah, and I just arrived there and I opened the big meditation hall and I was uh, firstly very shocked because normally big meditation hall, you should have very big golden Buddha statues and mm. it, the Buddha will look uh, down on you and like, you know, something like that. And there's like nothing, they're very beautiful stained glass and there was like written the gratitude, mm. the how can I say? The, the calligraphy. Yeah, cal cal calligraphy was there. And at the time, my English was even worse than now. And I couldn't understand what is the meaning of the gratitude. So I, I searched on dictionary and I said, oh, gratitude means gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> and, I <don't> <laughs> and I was shocked when why, why they put this calligraphy on the wall instead of the Buddha statue. And I don't know, those those. That was very strong impression for me. And everything was very ama amazing for me. Everything was very surprising for me because I used to always hold the phone and I, I'm really connected with the internet whole day. And I, I should be really uh, awake for the new new news trend, trend. So I should, I always like search and I, Something like that. But like in here, when you come here for the retreat, we really practice to be stopping and we really try to like 
be there fully, like with myself, not with internet. And like, everything was very new for me. And yeah, I think it was very, how can I say, like touch my curiosity. Yeah, and it makes me want to stay more and more. So like my plan was just staying in the lower hamlet for one week, but I extend one more week. And after that, I extend two more week and I went to the new hamlet. I stay one more month and I come back here as a summer volunteer one more month. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, what, and what was your father's reaction when you told him that you actually decided to become a nun? Yeah, because, you know, like uh, it was my first trip to... Plum Village, 2017, and that year I also decided to become a nun. It was same period. It was very quick. Mm -hmm. in, in it was in three months. I just come here and I okay. I, I think I should become a nun in here. And my father was surprised, but also not surprised because just before he brought me to the airport, he said, "You know, I think Plum Village is a really great place. So I think." If you want to stay there very long time as a nun, or something like that, and, and he he just it was like a little bit joke, like half joke and maybe half truth truth his mind, and and he said like if if you want to stay there, it's very good. I think nun is very good, very a uh, stable job uh, in this <laughs> modern society. <laughs> stable job, yeah, it's a very good Buddha company. You should be a hired. <laughs> 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 yeah, and so like that's why I, I when I make a phone call to my dad and I, I tell him like, do you remember you made a joke? Uh, what about if I become a nun, how do I will feel? And so maybe I, I think I'm considering about that job operation or something like that. And my father don't speak anything. Oh, my dear, maybe it's better you come back to Korea and we discuss it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did you go back? Yeah, I go back for making a visa. Uh -huh. And yeah, I already decided. Yeah. Brother Fapu, you, you know a, a lot of, obviously, as the abbot of Upper Hamlet, you see lots of new monastics or people coming in and, and making a commitment to become mm -hmm. a monastic. Can you just tell us a little bit about what that journey is like from people who say, actually, like sister here, I want to, I want to have that aspiration. I want to become a, a monastic. What is that journey like? And then sister, it'd be great to hear your specific story. So I would speak about for others. Yeah. Because I've, I've been observing more now and help training the new aspirant groups um, so when somebody comes to Plum Village and they they are inspired by this life and they want to make a commitment, um, they will, first of all, find a monastic to talk to and just to double check if their decision is correct and their idea of monastic life is accurate. And right now in Plum Village, uh, on the monk side in Upper Hamlet, we have established a window to come in for those who would like to become monastic and they come for the three month rain retreat. And it's very important that uh, before anybody make a decision, they come and to really just experience the life of a practitioner. Because we might have this idea that, oh, as a monastic, we're gonna do this, 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 or it's gonna be like this or like that. And our idea may be influenced by what we've read, what we've seen, a movie, or, or a picture, but um, it's so important to come and to see for yourself. And when somebody has that aspiration and they come in to share with us, we always would like to support them, but we don't want to be too enthusiastic because it has to be their real, ch um, it has to be a choice from them. It has to be like a heart commitment in a way. And then they would write a letter to us to explain um, why they would like to become an aspirant. And that's that's kind of like internship in a company. And you kind of like live your life as a monastic already. So then that person may may be with other members. Usually we we a group is formed and we call them families. So what is really big in our community is um, developing um, understanding of each other. That's why we 
have to know how to create joy and happiness together, how to live in harmony together, how to work together. And because that's the strength of the Plum Village community, that we all are walking on this path together. And so that family of aspirin will will live together in a dorm, and then they will be assigned a mentor, maybe one or two. And they will have class um, at least twice or three times a week, as well as join in with all of the other activities of the community. And they get one year of aspirinship. So they get to see the whole cycle of the community from winter to spring to summer and then autumn again. And through that journey, they get to really see if this is the life that they want to enter into. So it's it's a it's a chance for them to already taste it without making any commitment. And if anyone at any moment feels like they want to step out because they see that it is not for them, they just need to tell us and we're we're very supportive of them. Yeah. So sister, tell us your experience. So you've been a monastic for I think three years, you said. Mm-hmm. What has it been like from leading this very busy life up late <laughs> to uh, to now being up very early? Yeah. So so going to bed late and now very up, getting up very early, and 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 leading this completely different life. Tell us a bit about it. Mm. For me, I mean, I decided to become a nun because I mean, first I think I need to explain about that why I I wanted to become a nun and. For me, the summer retreat was very, very good for me. I, I really enjoyed the summer retreat and I, I worked as a volunteer, lay, lay friends volunteer. And I see a lot of children and a lot of family or teenager or like, like many from many different countries. And they really come here and practice together. And it makes me feel something, I don't know, something touchy deep inside of me and I feel like I really want to uh, part of it mm. to like contribute something I mean because I can feel like I can feel transformation from in myself little day by day and I feel like oh it would be very great to help others and that was my some some feeling because there are so many things like I was shocked uh, when I enter the plum village i mean as a lay person because i i feel like whatever the thai or whatever buddha teach me i feel like oh i i totally live opposite side of <laughs> those kind of things and that's why i was a little bit struggle and okay so i think so at, at the beginning i was thinking oh maybe i should make something i should make something like tv program or or like about about my profession, I should make something wholesome things. Okay, maybe I go back to Korea and I will uh, try something else. But like just day by day, I stay in the Plum Village. And when I see the people, I was thinking, oh, I think it's it's more quick if I want to make something change in the world. Maybe it's better to like uh, I help the people, like especially young people, like uh, children or young people. So if I can like help them to change their mind. I think they will go out and it's like a spread in the world and they they can really change the world. Maybe it's more quick than I just do it by myself. And I think that's why why I decide to become a nun at the beginning. And yeah, but after I entered the monastery, yeah, of course, everything is very, it's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was, it was very great, but it was also very, very big challenging for me because I mean, I I live very freely. I when I also work, I I'm not the like nine to six person. I I work, I can I could manage my time by myself. And but uh, uh, once you enter the monastery, I mean there is uh, some schedule, and you need to really follow the the schedule. Like uh, we need to wake up five a.m. and we go to the five thirty. We go to sitting meditation and. Like I mean, if if it's the in the uncle like a rains retreat, it's even more earlier. Like uh, wow, yeah, four thirty we wake up and the uh, five, yeah, we start our sitting meditation. Yeah, yeah, it's like that in New Hamlet. Yeah, <laughs> tough schedule. Tough yeah. schedule. Yeah, I mean because each Hamlet is different. But so it was not easy for me to adapt. I don't know get used to it mm. with that schedule because normally I sleep five a.m. 
Yeah, and then I will wake up maybe 10 or 11 a.m. and I go to work, something like that. But now I need to really uh, not sleep 5 a.m. a.m. I need to wake up 5 a.m. and I need to start my day. Mm. Yeah, and and also live with so many people. It was also very big challenge challenge for me because I I'm only child and I never share my room with anyone. Yeah, and it was uh, it was very big uh, change. How many people life. were in your room? Uh, you mean when you were an aspirant? When I when I was aspirant, I was also like only child in New Hamlet. So by yourself? Yeah, yeah, I was by oh. myself, and I ordained yeah only only one. But then when you became a nun? Okay, that's that's the. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed in one of the biggest room in in the New Hamlet, and I stay with six sisters, mm. and it very small room and really packed uh, the, our bed is next to each other i think maybe one meter mm. <laughs> yeah and yeah i have many many things i i i need to learn to like live harmoniously with mm. other people and but actually for me i was really concerned about the community life to live with others for me before i entered the monastery that one was one of my big concern oh can i do it like can i live with others like it was very difficult uh, no very uh, big concern for me but after enter the monastery those difficulties is nothing i mean it's not really important difficulties i i i had to really face with myself and that i think that one was more difficult moment for me and and sister just briefly tell us when you say you had to face the difficulties with yourself give us a flavor what what do you mean by that so for example like when i when i live as a lay i didn't know i have suffering for me there were so many ways to i can how can i say uh, not be concentrated i don't know disturbed mm -hmm. because as I tell you, because of my job and also maybe it's my, my personality or like deep in me, I don't want to really look at my problem. And I always try to find my way to run away. Mm. Like there was, it was uh, come to me with many different forms. I had many problems actually. I had like eating disorder and I had a like shopping problem or I had many problems. And, and also like when I was outside, like I... There's many ways to run away from myself, but after enter the monastery, I don't know in Upper Hamlet, but the New Hamlet is very difficult to have an internet. I mean, it, we we have a very clear guideline for the novices, and we whenever we do something like we also need to ask permission, and it's a very different way of life. So, actually, twenty four hours, I really need to focus on myself and. That's very different. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say. It. Like before, I had the same twenty four hours, but I feel like I always I don't have enough time for myself, and because you know work and I don't know meet with people and uh, SNS and Netflix and like uh, yeah, there's there are so many things to to cover. Spend, yeah, cover up, yeah. and I just spend my time. But after become a nun, I really just. There's only one I can think. One thing I can do is just really focus on myself, and so there was I could really realize many suffering in me and trans transform those suffering. It was take very long time. Mm -hmm. It's funny yeah. you mention that, yeah. sister, because um, just this morning I was talking with uh, one of the brothers about the fact that. Um, uh, I and my wife moved to Plum Village to live next to Plum Village just over a year ago. And, uh, you know, like you, I was living a very busy life, but in New York as a journalist for the for the Huff Post. And suddenly, and we had this wish to come and live next to Plum Village. And, and I've been really thinking that while we have a lovely home and it's lovely to be next to the monastics, I can't say I'm fully happy. And and why is that? And it's been needling me. And um, and then I realized two or three days ago, the most sometimes the answers are the most obvious, but but we don't immediately think of them. Realizing that actually, the reason I'm not fully happy is because I've stopped, and I'm having to face myself. So actually, I'm not. 
I, I'm feeling this sort of this this um, tension in myself because I'm in Plum Village, not in spite of being in Plum, Plum Village. So in a sense, this idea of how we stop, it means, as you say, we have to look at ourselves. And actually, when we really stop and take away all the extraneous stuff, all the things that can cinema, as you say, Netflix, um, mm -hmm. restaurants and everything, actually all we're left with is ourselves. And that's uh, that's quite a challenge. That's a real training right there. Yeah. I, I, like, I, I echo a lot what um, our sisters shared because I saw some of that in myself when I was um, also training in my training period as an aspirant. Because I joined when I was much younger, so I was 13. And what I realized is that, yes, now we don't have electronic games. We don't have um, TV to indulge yourself in. Suddenly, all you have is actually just people around you. But I was, I, I think I was a little bit more lucky because I grew up in a, in a more crowded household when I was young. So coming to Plum Village was much more um, easier for me um, being around so many different people. But um, what what we get to see is that the practice teaches us to re, to to see ourselves like a mirror. Everything you do is you. You can't put that blame on anyone else, and you cannot hide away from it, right? And what we are trained in our practice is that um, you, your happiness is not when you become a monk or a nun. That even as an aspirant or a lay practitioner, just practicing a normal person, when they can have moments of peace within themselves, that already is happiness. Mm. That you arrive right here, right now, that mindful step that you are making, that is happiness. And then that moment when you're able to do something together with the community, let's say um, gardening, we do. We, we have these community work days. It's one of my favorite um, work days in the week, where everybody um, put um, offers themselves um, to the one project of the community, and we all do it together. Either it's on the farm or it's planting trees, and at that very moment, like you really get to experience a community. Like you are one with many, and I think this was one of like the greatest gift. Um, for me as a young person, like growing up in this community and learning to see my habits and see my, 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 um, my shortcomings also, but you get to see it in other people too. <laughs> and then you don't feel alone. And, 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 and what is also really great is that we are, we are reminded that uh, the practice is not to be perfect. So I remember once when I interviewed Thich Nhat Hanh and I said to him, I said, Thai, you know, I trust you. And the reason I trust you is because you're a great Zen master. You've been through wars, you've been exiled, you've traveled the world, da, 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 da. And so when you speak, I, I feel that you've been forged in the fire of life. And I said, but these young monastics, why, why would I listen to them? You know, a lot of them, some of them, you know, some of them lived, lived a full life outside, but some of them have come here very young. Why, why would I listen to them? And he said, Joe, you have to understand that whatever happens outside the monastery also happens inside the monastery. Exactly. And that when you're speaking to people, you know, when you're speaking to these young monastics, they are going through all the trials and tribulations of everyone else. But I, I have a question, which is that, a lot of people hear about communities forming mm. and often there's a lot of competition and strife and you hear about communities full of uh, conflict and closing down after a few months because, because they're unable to sustain that, getting all these individuals together and they, people aren't able to make decisions together and they have different ideas and they, they get stuck. Now Plum Village next year celebrates its 40th anniversary. That's a long time. So I want to ask both of you, and maybe starting with you, Fapu, how, what is it about Plum Village and about the life and about 
the form of life here that has allowed this monastery and others around the world that are in the Plum Village tradition to to prosper and to sustain themselves? That's another big question. Joe's throwing big question after big question. <laughs> um, wow, that's a real meditation. I've I've actually I've meditated on that question a lot because our community is still growing, but one of the um, one of the things i can share that i feel confident in is that um because of a certain aspiration that all of us have been able to touch and have been able to manifest and been able to nourish together and that aspiration is very simple but it's very deep number one is we all want to learn to transform our suffering and the second is we all also want to help other people transform their suffering like those two ingredients are very important ingredients of monastics. And I think a community to to be sustainable, you have to have also a certain amount of harmonies. And in our Buddhist tradition, we have um, the six harmonies as our principle. And um, some of the harmonies that are very important in our community that, that we touch each day is that um, we practice the same Dhamma meaning the Dhamma, the way of meditation, we all do it together. We practice sitting together, we practice walking meditation. The kind of um, meditation um, classes are very in line with our principle. And then and then our direction, we share in a, the same direction. And in each, each individual, we also have our own aspiration, but a community should be sustainable enough and solid enough to offer enough space so that also each individual can express their talent within this community. And as an abbot, what I've learned is that um, if everyone feels heard and feels welcomed and feels a part of, then they will want to be, be a part of it and they will want to grow in it. And I think where maybe other communities is very difficult is because you're going to meet a lot of different people, but they not might not share the same interest and the same aspiration. And that's very hard to, to maintain because if we don't share the same aspiration, then there's going to be so much energies that we have to kind of like um, filter out and try to put together. But one one of the filters that we have in our community is all the monastics when they want to become monastic, is that they they share these two these two aspirations. One is understanding their suffering, transforming it, and the other is to help others, and that's what really brings us together. And then the other elements that we have in the harmonies is like we we learn to share our space together, um, we share our joy, and we share our success. That's really important because in our time where individualism is very um, prioritized, I, I guess, like we were all taught to, to be successful by ourselves growing up and, and now in a community, we, we have many talents and we have many types of leaders. I think a community need leader, but we don't need one leader. We, we can have many types of leaders and 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 when we offer a retreat, we have like people leading dharma sharing, people leading dharma talks, people leading dham walking, or even cooking. And for me, that's a leading like a team. You have leaders to prepare a, a meal mindfully, and it really offers joys to people. Get let them have good vegetarian food like that is a success too, you know. Um, but at the end of a retreat, what we all sense in in Plum Village is when we were able to finish a retreat and we see people's transformation in the retreat, we all feel that that is a success and that success is shared by all of us. So, so even though you are a young novice and you still taste that same success as an elder Dharma teacher in the community. So this kind of community development that we put in our Sangha, Sangha means community. It, we, it's, not, it's not just a one time a year we, we come together and we talk about it, but it's every day, every minute. And I think that's the difference. 
and and also i mean in a sense what you say about the community is also true of of relation of, of individual relationships so i i remember technatan would say you know about couples that you can share the same bed but if you don't have the same dream then actually it can never work out right so sister coming back to what brother fapu was saying about you know the life of you know in western society and it sounds also in career to some extent there's this whole idea of individualism. Mm. It's sort of, I have my space, I own my things, I am free because I, my commitment is only to myself. Um, so you said you've come into the monastery and become a monastic and then having to share a room with six people and having to follow very, very clear guidelines. What was that like? And also, do you miss it? Do you, do you actually, is there part of you that sometimes says, oh, I would love my own apartment. I'd love to wake up late. I'd love just to go off on holiday to the Bahamas. I'd love not to have to talk to anyone or be with anyone. Well, yes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's really, really the real, realistic question. And for me, like live in the big community, I really need to deal with my own habit energy. And also I need to deal with others, their own habit energy. And when we live together, of course, like at the beginning, it was very difficult because for me, before I entered the mona uh, be uh, ordained community, like as a monastic, and I feel it's every monks and nuns I think they are very already enlightened. Mm. They are very perfect. And like, but when I become a nun, yeah, I, I also live with together and like, I, I can see like, it's, it's individually, I feel like we, maybe we are not perfect, but I feel like as a Sangha, as a community, I feel we are, I cannot say perfect, but like we are very harmony, harmoniously can live together. So one, one of the things, um, that I know about the community is that that obviously there's always conflict, mm. and that and and you have certain practices that support the community. And, and one of the ones I want you just to talk about a bit about is shining light, mm. which is a um, well actually I I, I I don't need to explain it, you can but Brother Fapu just give a sense of of the shining light practice and how that supports the community yes. in sort of dealing with the the difficult things that often go unsaid but actually need to be said mm. so i think we have two two dharma doors two practices that that will take care of the conflicts in the sangha so the first one is beginning anew which is will be like day-to-day -day, um difficulties that we we have with each other throughout the year and then what you mentioned joe is uh, the practice of shining light that is um that is like at the end of the year that we would do it all together and the nuns would do it with the nuns and the monks would do it with the monks and i we can only do this because we live with each other like throughout the year like 365 days and shining light is a practice that helps oneself see themselves more clearly and the community will also have a chance to share what they have observed about you in your daily life through one year and we we look at um we look at um your flowers like what are the wonderful qualities that you have and everyone has amazing qualities and it's very lovely like shining light sessions are one of the most wholehearted and cozy and warm um atmospheres that that i get to be in touch because it comes from love because we, we want to share with that person who they are and what we see so we share about their wonderful qualities in their way of being what they contribute sometimes like some somebody who's just their way of smiling brightens up the community and that needs to be shared because that person might not know and so we let them know. And then we go into another um, category. It's like we see some some habits maybe that they might not be aware of that we want to point out that they can transform. Um, for example, like this is on, on my own shining light that I've received in previous years. It's like, because I do a lot of... Um, meetings and I facilitate them. So whenever I'm listening and I don't like something that is being shared, I would have a particular facial expression 
and then the, everyone sees it but i'm not aware that i'm doing it it's because it's my habit so the community shares that with me they're like dear brother you know um in meetings whenever you don't like something everyone knows <laughs> and and you might know not know it and it's it's very true and so so the community has a safe space to share this and they share it very lovingly so there's a beautiful text that we read before shining light and it goes something like you know we are all cells of one body so if i shine light on you is also i am shining light on myself and if you transform i transform and if you have beautiful qualities that means the community has all of these beautiful qualities so it's this insight of teaching of interbeing means everything into our everything's interconnected and then the third categories that we would um, have a chance to share is suggestions of the practice so suggestions for them to grow um and we we have a few themes that we would look at like we're not we're not there to criticize everything about you because nobody's perfect but we would look at um, elements of their practice elements of their mindful manners meaning how they behave as a monastic how how they conduct themselves as a monastic and then their studies um their service their way of serving the community and serving mean has so many layers like through working together um building a, a deck together from cooking together washing up cleaning the toilet together these are all services and that we can share like a lot of times a lot of brothers um they get um the shining light like they're so responsible like the, the work coordinator doesn't need to tell them anything and they're like right there on time and they will always always go the distant mile just because of their love for the community and then their joy how much joy do they have but our practice has evolved through the years so um before like the sangha would shine light on someone but then at one stage I don't I don't know if the sisters do it but on the brother side we do it is that before the the community shine lights on you the community asks you to shine light on yourself first so how about you like what do you see in the last year what have you done for you um uh, what have you been able to transform for yourself what have you recognized in yourself and etc and at the end of the year we get a letter of our shining light it's like our report card and it's very beautiful because we get to there's cuz our community like on the monk side right now we have like 60 brothers and i'm not close to every brother so there's some brothers i i joined the session and and I, and i don't say anything but i get to hear the other brothers share about that brother and i get to understand that brother so much more and uh you mentioned about beginning a new brother and um and that's something that's not just relevant for monastics but actually is very relevant for anybody and in fact um my wife and i you know we've been together for nearly 15 years and every week mm. pretty much every week there's a there's a few we've missed over the years but we practice that and it's actually been i think one of the core foundations of our healthy relationship and just uh, for our listeners just to just to explain a bit because it's it's just a a formal practice that we do once a week where it's an opportunity to in a sense do a my um a uh, sort of very mini shining light so we have a process where first of all if it's if i start i will say what i've really appreciated about my wife in that last week and very specific things not just i love you but mm-hmm. it was so amazing when i came home late and and you had made a meal for me or thank you so much for supporting me when i was feeling really low yesterday and then it's a chance to show regret so if i let's say got angry or frustrated with her during the week i can just say look you know i recognize i got frustrated with you and and this is the reason and i i'm sorry and then it's a chance what we call it development just to say was there something that upset us or frustrated us about uh, uh about each other's behavior and then we finish with a sort of uh, as you call it a flower watering where we just talk about you know our love for each other mm. and um and the reason i sort of was sort of in a sense minded to start that because i always remember tiknatan saying you know that that relationships never break up from out of the blue something major happening it's from the the very minor drip drip it is talked about it like a stalactite or a stalactite in a cave where it's just the small drip of 
problems that at the time are very often not addressed because there's no formal space that's accepted and it's difficult sometimes to raise a small issue. But over time, those become calcified and can one day just blow out of mm -hmm. nowhere. So um, I, just to say that that practice has been fantastically mm. helpful for us. And, and it's a bit like what you're saying, it creates a formal space mm. in which you're welcome to express that. It's not about an argument. It's not saying, well, I think this is, it's just a chance to deeply listen to each other. And, um, and Thich Nhat Hanh always says, you know, that love is understanding. Mm. And I think what you're saying is that unless we start to more deeply understand each other, then actually you don't really generate love. Right. And, and just one more aspect of the beginning anew is that we also have a chance to also ask for help Because sometimes we we live together, and maybe if we don't create that that space, we'll never be able to share some of our difficulties. And I think this this has helped our community a lot because it's it's the dynamic of having so many people is wonderful, but sometimes the so many people also makes us distant from each other. But um, if we create the space where everyone feels connected then they can share like our oh, dear brothers, you know, in the last few months, like this, this suffering has manifested and I'm taking care of it. I just want everyone to know and please support me. And it's something so simple like that when you can say, please support me and just everyone understands you. And, and if I have a judgment about someone, I'm like, oh, he's going through that. Oh, wow. I have compassion for him. And, and that helps me transform also. So that aspect of, um, That step in beginning new is also very, very, very powerful. So you talk about transformation. So, so sister, give give me an example of something, an issue that you, a problem, a challenge you had in your life before you became a monastic when you were living in Korea, and how the monastic practice and and living here for the last three years has helped you to come more to peace with it. For me, I feel personally, I feel there there is a, so many transformation, and like this is not only I feel my my especially my parents really feel from me like they really not at the beginning they really uh, against to become a become a nun. I mean, my father was kind of okay, but like my mom was kind of shocked, and she really don't she doesn't want me become a monastic until that day I ordained. Yeah, and. But now she really accept because she said she see me more happier, and because before I I'm very easy to upset and I'm I will make you cry very quickly, <laughs> like in 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 a certain uh, situation, like especially when you work together, I will become very perfectionist, and if something is wrong, like. Uh, out of my control or out of my plan, I will upset and I will angry and I will make people cry, you know, something like that. And those kind of things, my my anger issues is really changed. Mm. Yeah, it, it's really it really changed. And I don't know, it's it's not like change like one at, at one time just yesterday I angry and today I don't feel any more angry. It's not like that. Like I think it was like year by year. I slowly, it really changed. Mm -hmm. And so, after uh, I become a nun, there is so many situations that I can be angry. Yeah, and maybe at the beginning I I was also angry and I talk back to the, my elder sisters and I yeah may create many problem. Like, but I think now when I when th there is a similar situation happen, I can see myself. I really stop. And I really try to come back to my my breathing. And I know there is some method that that will help me, and and it also really work. It's not really suppress my feeling. I just really try to be there with my emotion, and I can see more situation clearly. And there is like no need to be. Uh, I express anger in that way, and I think that one was also one of the, my biggest transformation. And like I really want to free from my emotions you know like i i really want to be free from that desiring that uh want to be like alone or want to be everything should be uh, in my plan or many things that there are so many things that makes me not free 
And I think like year by year, the practicing, I think I really, I cannot say totally I'm free from it, but I, I feel like I feel more freer than before. And that's for me, it's very big transformation. And, and sister, uh, there's a lot of pressure um, uh, all over the world, actually, not in every country, but in many Western countries and Asian countries for a woman to look a particular way to have your hair in a particular way, to wear makeup, perfume, oh, yeah. to, to, to uh, you know, choose your own clothes. And it's a, it's, a, it's a strong way of women to express themselves, but also there's, a, there's an expectation uh, of women to be as, in a certain way. So you, as a monastic, have shaved your head and you have um, two or three brown robes. You don't wear makeup, you don't wear perfume. What does that feel like does that feel like freedom or it's, do you miss it's, it it's wonderful <laughs> yeah <laughs> i highly recommend uh, many women you can become a nun <laughs> you can be really free from all that obstacles and uh, that makes you really stuck you know mm. like you know I've, i'm from korea and because of my career i also need to be very uh take care of my outer form, out, outlook. And I always wear the makeup and my hair. I spend a lot of money for my hair and my clothes and uh, buy fancy bags, many things, something like that. But like now I don't have, I don't have to worry at all about those kind of things. Like I open the drawer and there's only, I, I have a, only, only every color same brown, <laughs> <laughs> every color same brown. And I don't, and it's very interesting because it's really, it's really the feeling of freedom, mm. like f from that leap, simple, simple, uh, simplicity, like yeah. simple life. It's really makes me very creative, like not in uh, create the, uh, how can they put effort to uh, make beauty of outer form, but I feel like I have more energy to, to take care of my inner beauty and that's really, really different, you know? Like, and it's very, uh, it's, it's really cool. It's satisfying. It's yeah. satisfying. You know, yeah. I, I, I was like one person who really think about my, the clothes and yeah. the makeup and the hair. And I mean, as I shared, I also spend a lot of money, a lot of money for, for those kind of things. And, and like before I sleep, I normally choose the clothes and the all the color of lipstick everything uh before i sleep so after morning i can be just uh, wear those things and i go i can go to the work something like that but yeah it's really <laughs> and is there no outfit or bag that you miss at all uh, but but actually have... yeah i mean i mean that, that that's a little bit the different point because i become a bit before become a nun i mean as a lay person i think i already start to practice minimalism mm. so Already, like uh, there was two years of the transition, tr transition, transition to I. I want to make my lifestyle more smaller, 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 Sis more simpler, simpler. Because yeah. I feel I was a little bit sick of those kind of things, like consume mm. so many things. I mean, as I shared, I had a shopping problem. I had so many shoes. <laughs> I had so many bags and clothes. <laughs> you cannot imagine. I live alone, but like it's mm -hmm. full packed of many fancy things, and I spend a lot of money for those kind of things. And I think at some at some point in time, I really wanted to change my life. Where yeah. where's all that stuff now, sister? That you're not. So <laughs> <laughs> did you did you donate it all? So like I mean, because I I shared like there was trans transitions years, yeah, like yeah. two or three years. I really uh, donate a lot, and I also the I also maybe generate a lot of trash maybe at the time, and mm. I also give away to my friends a lot. And just be, before become a monastic, when when I went back to Korea, I I really need to uh, clean up and like really sell my apartments and, and everything and it was very easy already my room was quite empty so it was very easy to like move out but there was still many fancy things that i keep because i didn't know i would become a nun ah. yeah yeah and i give away all those things to my friends and my friends were super happy and they asked me like many times are you sure i think you will come back in two months <laughs> <laughs> are you sure <laughs> Um, and brother, um, the same question for you. I mean, yeah. a, a moment of transformation that, that comes to mind. And also, 
you know, I you you also I have the sense of you 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 have a a deep sense of beauty um, <laughs> and and appreciation of of lovely things. I'm just wondering, you know, how you, it feels also for a man to mm. just um, live, yeah, with no formal ex- external expression of who they are. I think for myself, one of the transformation that I recognize is um, overcoming my inf- inferiority complex. And um, I think because I'm small, I'm a small person, my figure is quite small. So go, 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 growing up and going to school, I was always the smallest in the classroom. And I was always like um, the kid that needed protection. Like all of my friends would always like protect me from bullies and things like that. And then growing up as a um, Vietnamese son of a refugee in Canada. Also, I had some complexes about like, who am I? What am I? What is my ethnicity? What is my race? Like, I had a lot of questions and um, coming to the community in Plum Village and becoming a monk was learning to let all of that go away and then really rec- and being in touch with yourself, like what our sisters have been sharing. And I see that true beauty and and true stability, it comes from inwards. And I think when I was able to see that inside of me, I was so happy, Joe. Like I was, I felt like I didn't have to um, run after something. And that was, that insight was was something that gave me motivation to continue this practice and continue to to grow as a monk um so it was an i it was an insight that i gained that i was able to touch by the simplicity of the life but nevertheless like you know becoming a teenager and then growing as a young adult like i still had all of these temptations from the world all of these trends you see outside and you're like, oh, what would fit in the monk's life, you know? And one thing that I, I, I can share is like, I do love also clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, I, I have this like thing for like sim- simple clothes, but very beautiful, very um, neat and tidy. But um, thanks to the practice, we, we learn about moderation. And when you have one thing that is that is beautiful and it does what it needs, you don't have to search for anything else. And so for myself, like I apply that to everything, like even happiness or like my community, even though we're not the best and we have shortcomings, but that's good enough. I don't need to keep searching or else I'm just gonna be going round and round looking for something. So this complex of inferiority that I've had has has always um, been something that, that I worked with through through my monastic journey. And uh, one of the greatest help was all the friends who come by being with them and then hearing them share and water my flower, just saying, oh, dear brother, your, your practice uh, helps me become more mindful. Just something as simple as that, that helped me gain confidence and that helped me also touch my own stability. So, yeah, the monastic community, of course, is, is very supportive, but also all of the lay community, all of the lay friends, all of the people who come to our monastery, they, they are my also my great support. Yeah, and I, I know, I mean, for, for myself, you know, the, I think the greatest transformation of coming to Plum Village every year and then coming to live is, is the opportunity, which I think we're all saying in different ways, was to come back to myself, mm. was to feel that I actually I could just, be happy with myself. Thich Nhat Hanh has that calligraphy, be beautiful, be yourself. Mm. Just letting go of the extraneous stuff, letting go of things outside and just saying, actually, I'm good enough as I am. And actually, I want to be myself. I don't want to be this egoic mask of myself that's that's seeking to feel better about myself by, by proving anything. But actually, I can just be truly who I am mm. and be at peace and... Um, and it makes life so much more enjoyable not to be wanting to grasp things or think that something outside of us is going to make us happy. Yeah. So I'm aware of time. 
Um, yes. So I just wanted to, uh, sister, thank you. It's a joy having you. You're you're uh, you're an amazing presence. Every time I see you, I, I feel your vibrant energy and um, and your beautiful sort of sense of humor and uh, and I always look forward to seeing you. So I'm glad we were able to draw you into our podcast. Um, and dear listeners, if you've enjoyed. Um, this episode. Um, please find us on um, Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on other platforms that carry podcasts, and particularly our very own Plum Village app. And uh, to finish, um, Brother Fapu, in time honored tradition, um, and we do this on nearly every episode, um, I wonder if you would op- um, give us a. Uh, guided meditation. Hello, friends. Whether you are sitting on the bus, sitting on a train, going for a walk, going for a run, or cleaning your house and enjoying this podcast, if you can allow yourself to be still, whether standing or sitting, I would like to share and to offer you a guided meditation. In this very moment, Become aware of the body. What senses do you have? Is there any pain? And then now let us bring our attention to our breath. Breathing in, I am aware of my in-breath. Breathing out, I'm aware of my out-breath. Let all, any tension that you have and just bring it to your in-breath and out-breath. Let the breathing soothe the body. In-breath, out-breath. And as I breathe in, I become aware that I have a body. And as I breathe out, I relax my body, breathing in, aware of my body, breathing out, I relax my body. If our mind is running to the future or running to the past, it's okay, but just be gentle and call it by his name, ah running to the future or running to the past and let it guide and guide that mind to the present with the breathing, just in breath, out breath. Let us develop our concentration. As I breathe in, I follow my in breath from the beginning to the end. And as I breathe out, I follow my out-breath from the beginning to the end. So deep in-breath from the beginning to the end. And a slow out-breath from the beginning to the end. As I breathe in, I feel there is a peace, a stillness inside of me. And as I breathe out, I enjoy this peace, this stillness. In, peace, out, stillness. As I breathe in, I connect to all the wonders of life. As I breathe out, I see how precious life is. In wonders of life, out, how precious life is inside of me and all around me. The trees, the birds, the sunshine, the sound of a child, all of this are wonders of life. 
breathing in, I connect to my in-breath. Mindfulness is present. As I breathe out, I enjoy my out-breath. So simple, but so deep. In, enjoying my in-breath. Out, I am here in the present moment. Thank you, dear friends, dear listeners, for joining us in today's podcast, as well as practicing with us this mindful breath. And we look forward to seeing you again in our next episode. Yeah.